Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Flourish FM. In this episode, we spoke to Francis Sue. He's the Benedict Sankawa Professor of Mathematics at Harvey Mudd College and a former president of the Mathematical Association of America. In 2013, he received the HIMO Award, a nationwide teaching prize for college math faculty. And in 2018, he won the Halmos Ford Writing Award. His work has been featured in Quanta Magazine, Wired and the New York Times. And his 2020 book, Mathematics for Human Flourishing, which won the 2021 Euler Book Prize, offers an inclusive vision of what math is, who it's for, and why anyone should learn it. Nick, what did you like most about our conversation? That right there, that last sentence, right? Like that's exactly what the conversation was for me, which was sort Mm -hmm. of this um, really like beautifully woven argument of how math is much more accessible, much more ubiquitous, much more beautiful than most of us, I think, think of it as. And that really it can, in its best case scenario, and should in its best case scenario, be a pathway to greater flourishing, whether that's virtue cultivation or a whole different set of skills, right? So Mm -hmm. for me, it was like, it was kind of just fun cognitive dissonance, right? I don't necessarily love maths, as you would call it. Um, And I'm not necessarily good at them either. And those two things are probably correlated. So for him to kind of push back and show me this other perspective, I think was was fun. Awesome. Great. Yeah, I love that too. Um, I love the way he talked about how we can cultivate particular virtues through maths. And I just have profound respect for him as an educator. And um, one thing that I particularly liked was in his book and in the conversation was where he spoke about his correspondence with Christopher Jackson, this an inmate serving a 32-year sentence for armed robberies and Christopher wrote to uh, Francis seven years into his sentence about his passion for mathematics and since then they've had this ongoing correspondence which is laced throughout the book and um, that was one of many things that that led to this profound you know account of how he educates mathematics in this deep meaningful sense to promote human flourishing. All right so Enjoy your episode. This is our conversation with Francis Sue. Hey, Francis, how you doing? Good. How are you? Very well, thank you. Great to meet you. Nice meeting you too. Thank you so much for joining us today. Really enjoyed reading your book, Mathematics for Human Flourishing. Really enjoying diving in deep to discuss it today. So let's start with that. You describe your book, Mathematics for Human Flourishing, as a book that grounds mathematics in what it means to be a human being and to live a more fully human life. And you argue that maths, and I'm going to have to. <laughs> Yeah, this will be good. Yeah, maths today instead of math. (laughs) (laughs) You argue that I'll stick to mathematics where I can. You argue that mathematics helps people flourish, and you you seem to hold that the true purpose of mathematics, hence the title of your book, is that to help people flourish. So, could you please tell us what you argue the relation is between mathematics and flourishing, and how mathematics supports flourishing? Yeah, I I guess the way that I think about mathematics is um, as something that causes that that should cause joy when people encounter mathematics and that you know and realize it's very different than most people's experience of math and and part of the the question i think that 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 started the book was the question of what is it about you know th- think a little bit about any human desire that you have any hobby that you have like what 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 draws you to do that hobby uh and if you think about it it's it's often because that hobby meets some basic human need some human desire uh, and so if you look at those who do math professionally or those who do, who do math for a living, the, the reasons that you might, you, might, uh, you might find that these people do math are often very different than the kinds of impressions that people have growing up, you know, when they, they learn mathematics. You know, people often talk about math as beautiful as a reason to study mathematics, uh, or maybe because it's useful, maybe because it's, there's a lot of... Um, um, ways that it might help us see and understand the world. Uh, but, you know, that's very different than the kind of impression that people have of math as just sort of this dry thing that you do to learn how to compute, you know. Mm-hmm. So um, so p- part of the way I thought about writing the book was to frame it as really a meditation on what it means to be a human being. And then through the lens of that, using mathematical um, examples, trying to elucidate how it is that math can actually help us understand um, our humanness in some sense. Mm-hmm. Okay, so there's, you mentioned, you started off by saying that, I mean, within this, that there are human needs that mathematics can 
can tend to and, and help us fulfill and reach. The first one was joy, that mathematics is a, is a great source of joy. Is that the main need? Are there other needs that you think mathematics supports that relate to flourishing? Oh, yeah. So I uh, I mean, I, I, I guess even before I think about joy, I mean, joy is maybe an outcome. I think about a basic human need that people have for beauty, uh, a human need for truth, you know, human a desire that we all have for uh, exploration, for freedom. You know, these are all kinds of things that all order, order looking at, at uh, understanding um, the, the structure of the, the way things work, the universe, you know, things like that. So, you know, we all we we all have these deep human desires and, and math meets these desires in certain uh, in certain ways that that uh, I think often get missed. You know, like people don't talk about math as beautiful often when they're when you encounter mathematics. Um, you know, people talk about math as just doing the math. Right. There's a phrase mm-hmm. that's almost like it means get out your calculator or you do it, do it in your head or try to be faster than your calculator. Like this is, this is dull, right? Like yeah. why would I want to learn something that, that a calculator could do even better than me, right? Like that's, that's, that, that shouldn't be the true purpose of mathematics. There might be reasons for doing it, right? Like there, there might be reasons for learning your times tables, but it's not, that's not the ultimate essence of what it means to do math. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so- Carry on, Nick, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. I just jump in here because uh, one of the questions we eventually wanted to ask is just why did you write this book, right? And what I think I hear, please correct me if I'm wrong, at least in part, is to kind of shine this perspective or shine the light on that perspective and that experience a little bit more and really maybe hopefully bring some more people over the fence, so to speak, to this like math is beautiful, math can lead to flourishing, you know, sort of perspective, right? So let's let's say that, you know, I think the book does that in a, in a very nice way. Let's say that you brought some of those people over. What can that lead to, right? Like when they start to have that perspective, what would be some of sort of the flourishing outcomes that you might expect to see? Yeah, so I'll give an example. So uh, when math is taught well, it should uh, uh, cause us to have a, a deeper appreciation of the truth, right? Mm. It should cause us to actually want to dig deep whenever we encounter uh you know, maybe two conflicting viewpoints, it should cause us to want to understand a, a problem from multiple perspectives, right? This is something that MathMax actually teaches us in, in its best forms, you learn how to do. You learn how to approach a problem from many different angles. Uh, and that causes us to to, uh, to 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 actually feel like we you're on the right path if both if both if both methods of doing a problem actually lead to the same answer, then you have more confidence that you actually see truth, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. If they, if if those two methods don't quite jive with one another, it actually asks causes you to ask, okay, where where did I go wrong? What's uh, you know what's the source of this incongruity between these two perspectives, right? So. And I think that carries over to other areas of our lives, right? Like if you you have mathematical training, then then you're not going to be satisfied with just trusting some authority to tell you what the answer is, right? You learn to think for yourself. You learn yeah, to my, my head went straight to like, oh, that I bet that would impact cognitive dissonance, right? I bet that would impact disconfirmation bias and confirmation bias is just the willingness to go to that place where it's like, oh no, there might be an objective truth where wherein I'm wrong. I better like check my math. I, you know, it's actually, now that you say it, when I'm teaching cognitive behavioral stuff, and we talk about reviewing our thoughts and challenging our beliefs. I actually use the example of checking your math, so to speak, <laughs> to make sure it adds up. I've never thought about it that way, but yeah, super and, interesting. And, and especially in in you know today's uh, very hyper, um, uh, uh, very divided you know culture yeah. that we live yeah, yeah. in, you know we, we really have to 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 actually start thinking for ourselves rather than just trusting something because somebody said something, right? Like, how do you actually know whether something is true? You actually try to look at it yourself, dig deep. Um, so, you know, that that's how, that's how, you know, this idea of this quest for truth in mathematics actually should change the way we live uh, mm-hmm. our lives. Mm-hmm. Now, if you are interested, for instance, in beauty, you know, one of the things that you you learn in mathematics when you have a great math experience is you learn to expect enchantment, 
right? You learn to expect to see things that are uh, amazing and beautiful. And that's what keeps you coming back for more. Mm -hmm. And this expectation of enchantment actually is in, it enriches our lives. It causes us to look for patterns where we might not otherwise have expected to see them. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that, you know, that's going to, that's going to change the way you look at the world, no matter what your profession is, right? That's a better answer to the question. Why should I learn this stuff? Which is what most people ask when they learn, they learn math is like, why do I need to know this stuff? You know, most of the stuff you learn past, you know, in high school or beyond is, is often stuff that you'll never actually use unless you're a scientist, which is great that some people are going to become scientists, but for the large majority of people, why in the world do they need to know the Pythagorean theorem, right? Or, um, or the calculus, right? And there are better answers to that question. It's not for the utility. It's for the way it changes the way you live. It's for the way it changes the way you think, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'll just I, I give you okay. I'll give you another example. So, yeah, please. Um, please. I have a two-year-old son, uh, and uh, my son is just learning, you know, words and 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 you know he's sort of noticing. He's doing something very mathematical. He's he's noticing relationships and patterns, and he's seeing things that yeah. I that I don't see. Right, like the other. Just recently, we. Um, so we we the, the the his whole life we actually had had no TV in the house and then we recently unpacked our TV, uh, and he was like floored. He was amazed. He never seen anything so wonderful, right? And so he said uh, the next day he said, "Shall we turn on big phone?" <laughs> and I was like, "What?" And then he pulled us over to the TV and we're like, "Oh yes, that's right." His experience of this new object is that it's a big phone which is, you know, he's only ever watched videos on little, you know, mm -hmm. our iPhones. And what is he doing? He's he's learning to abstract, right? Abstraction is uh, is actually something that's that's very powerful, right? It, it, it enables him to, to look at many different kinds of furry animals and call them dogs, even though they look completely different. He's somehow figured out the essence of what makes a dog a dog, and he knows the difference between a dog and a cat, right? Well to, tie, well, to tie like what you're saying here, so I, I mentioned earlier, John and I, you know, sort of exist in this world of flow science and flow coaching as well. And so we're spending a lot of time just thinking about like dopamine rewards. And I think about what you've talked about in terms of mathematics as joy, right? But my understanding is like, we get pretty intense reward neurochemistry from detecting patterns, right? Like, we're really kind of evolutionarily primed to do that because it yeah. is so advantageous, right? So like when you think of it that way, it makes a lot of sense to me that this could be experienced, whether it's joy or pride or, but like some sort of pleasantness, some sort of satisfaction, Enchantment. right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's the way I like to talk about it. I, yeah. You know, it's, it's seeing some things that you, uh, ma making connections, seeing something that gives you a certain amount of pleasure just because it's, it's interesting. It's enchanting. Yeah. Um, Sudoku. <laughs> like that, right? That's not, some, maybe not math, some, but yes. yeah, that gets me. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, that's a certain kind of mathematical thinking. And of course, mm. I, th I think, you know, there, the, 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 the other thing that I think is, is probably critical here is, is that math is a lot of different, encompasses a lot of different virtues. It's not just learning to compute something quickly, right? It's actually looking at the world completely different ways. And, and what that means is you might like Sudoku and enjoy that kind of mathematical thinking. And I might enjoy visualizing three-dimensional objects. That's yeah. another kind of mathematical uh, virtue, being able to do that, right? And 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 we need to broaden the what we think of as mathematics so that, that more people, I think, will find a home in it. Great. Yes, yeah. Let's yeah, dig well, in deep to that. Perfect. Can we we to, want to connect all this yeah. up. This is exactly where we wanted to go. John, like, you you know, take us through the question on virtue, but I'd also suggest if we can, let's connect virtue to these different models of flourishing and then maybe go into how math, you know, math, maths, excuse me, John, um, you know, <laughs> cultivates virtue. Um, yeah. So, so far, Francis, you've mentioned that maths helps us appreciate the truth or the good teaching of maths should cultivate a respect for the truth and an interest in pursuing the truth among students. And you've also mentioned an appreciation of beauty 
as well. And, you know, it's clear that virtue plays an important role in your definition of flourishing, which is you know pretty common amongst theories of flourishing to, to build virtue into it as an important, perhaps even the most important part of the theory and um, the relation you describe between math and flourishing. And you, you write that the proper practice of mathematics cultivates virtues that help people flourish. You describe, you know, virtues such as creativity, imagination, persistence, contemplation, and confidence in struggle, and, and many others as well. So could you please describe the role that virtue plays in mathematics and whether math plays a distinctive role for cultivating mm. virtues or whether it's math plays a role similar to how perhaps, you know, engaging in music or art also cultivates virtues, but perhaps sports, 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 yeah, sports competition. Well. Yeah. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. I, I, I certainly want to say that, that math is the only way to cultivate virtue, because as you mentioned, lots of different ways you can, you can cultivate virtue. And some of them might be similar to mathematics. I mean, that's part of the analogy between mathematics and sport or mathematics and music, right? Mathematics uh, in sport, I would say the, the ability to look at a at a, a, a problem from multiple points of view is something that's built by playing the sport because you learn to look at a game from your point of view and your opponents, right? And you you have this idea, like you, you start thinking about what they're seeing and what you're seeing, and that enables you to, to play the game, right? That's, yeah. that's, you know, in mathematics, you do that as well. So there, there are similar ways in which the, these different uh, pursuits cultivate virtue. Uh, but then, you know, I would say some of them are 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 unique to mathematics, right? Like, mm. um, you know, the kinds of beauty that, for instance, you might grow to appreciate in math, I think is distinctive uh, in, mm. in, in some ways, right? There's people often, mathematical uh, thinkers often talk about trans a certain kind of transcendence, right? Mm. Um, in my book, I, I uh, quote Simone Weil, who talked about her yearning for transcendence, right? The, the, the transcendence that her brother sees. She she wasn't a mathematician, uh, although she was a mathematical thinker, but she always compared herself to her brother, who was, you know, a, a very famous, one of the most famous mathematicians of the 20th century. Uh, and, and she yearned for the transcendence that that um, she felt that only the truly great have access to, right? That's a that's a yearning, uh, a, an experience that is available in mathematics. Like I would say, everybody should have the opportunity to experience a beautiful proof, right? Like the the the, the fact that a demonstration of an interesting uh, of a truth can be itself beautiful is is perhaps unique to mathematics and it, everyone should demand it as a human right, like to be able to at least glimpse that, right? It's, it's, um, you know, it's almost, it, people often talk about it almost in religious terms, right? It's, it's, it's almost divine. <laughs> it's almost like uh, another writer talked about it, Jordan Ellenberg, who writes some popular books about math, talked about it. it's like putting your hand on the wire uh, and, and, um, you reach into the universe's guts and push and you put your hand on the wire and you like get this, this, this thrill, right. That's, um, it's hard to describe. So, so uh, yeah. last week, John, I mean, John has some follow-up questions about some other virtues. We could go, I think a bunch of different roads, but uh, just something that popped in my mind last week, we talked with Dr. Lisa Miller, who is an expert in spirituality or spirituality psychology. Like, are you describing math as a spiritual experience for many people? Do you think it can be deeply connected to meaning as this like source of truth and source of like, oh, I can trust that, right? Is that what you're describing? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say that mathematical people are necessarily religious people, but sure. Math <laughs> sure. The, the mathematical experience in many ways parallels uh, the the kinds of experiences that other people have in, with religious pursuits. And we right. would distinguish, and Dr. Miller does, like, we would not use spirituality and religiosity synonymously. Right? Oh, so, okay. So okay. I, think, I actually think these these kind of co coexist or can coexist, yeah. Yeah, I mean, in, in, in some sense, in math, you're often, you know, pushed into contact with things that are eternal, right? The mm. eternal laws of the universe. Um, mm. You uh, learn to appreciate the infinite. Um, you... Uh, you feel small in relation to the infinite often, right? Uh, and that's a that's a quality that often people, you know, experience in in in, um, in spiritual pursuits as well. Yeah. So awesome. they're, they're yeah. 
Oh, this is this is fascinating. Thank you, Francis. On a on a side note, can I ask you actually? So, my background's in philosophy, and philosophers have often said to me that many, or even sometimes most, mathematicians are Platonists about mathematics, in the sense that they believe that mathematical entities are, are meta correspond to metaphysical entities because of this eternal nature they have. Would you, as as a professional mathematician, would you say that's an accurate description of? of what mathematici- mathematicians tend to believe? Yeah, so, um, I mean, I guess there are, man- there are many ways, many kinds of views you could have about mathematics. I think what you're describing, the Platonist view, is the idea that mathematics is is um, discovered. Um, and one, one point of view might contrast that with is whether mathematics is created. And I, I guess I would say it's both, right? It's both the human structure, it's something that, that is um, that does have an independent reality. Like it wouldn't surprise me if I encountered an alien civilization somewhere that they would come up with whole numbers, right? I mean, um, it, it's not. It's it's. We've seen many times uh, in the history of mathematical ideas that the same idea has been rediscovered over and over and over by many different cultures around the globe, even ones that are separated by you know. Uh, oceans or culture or time you know it's it's uh and so that points to the fact that there is a platonist reality um that we're somehow accessing and that should surprise us as well right philosophers um uh uh often ask this question like how is it that einstein even asked this question how is it that that things that might be figments of our imagination uh so accurately describe the world right why Mm -hmm. is that you know that's a mm-hmm. that's a deep question that that is is fun to think about. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so when I call myself a Platonist, I guess I would say uh, I I lean towards Platonism, but I I don't have a problem saying that math is both created and discovered. I mean, there are human aspects of the creation, like creating a mathematical proof, right? I there are many routes to 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 establishing the truth of an idea. And I make creative choices when I decide how I want to think about them. Um, it's kind of like saying, Matt, you know, light is both a particle and a wave. I have no problem saying that it's both. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you. So let's let's dig a little deeper on, on this question of the role of virtue in mathematics and the role of mathematics in virtue, because this is so important to flourishing. And it seems that we might here identify perhaps the most important way in which your, your book contributes towards identifying a place that mathematics has perhaps even uniquely within human flourishing because you've you've mentioned there that there may be a virtue or a few that are uh, that mathematics is uniquely strong in cultivating or perhaps even unique in cultivating um the the key example i take it so far is the virtue of being able to see beauty perhaps of a transcendent kind within engaging in you know, work with numbers or theory construction using mathematics and so on, which is a yeah. different kind of aesthetic appreciation to what you get in art or music or literature and so on. So is that the only one that you would argue is unique to mathematics? And is it unique or is it that mathematics is uniquely placed in how much it can cultivate that virtue over other disciplines? Well, I would say, uh, 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 it, so it's certainly not the only, you know, the the only one that I think is is unique to mathematics. I'm going to give you another one that that um, that might be um, you might think of as mathematics uniquely co- contributing to, and that is the the ability to abstract, right? The mm-hmm. the the idea that um, you can recognize uh, the same, you know, a bunch of different objects and call them the same thing because they have essentially the same nature. That's a that's that's the virtue of abstraction. Now, you might say that happens in other fields. It certainly does, but I would argue it's because you're actually using mathematical thinking in those other fields. So it's it's maybe um, less apparent that it's unique to mathematics because mathematics is so embedded, mathematical thinking is so embedded in the way we do all these other things. That's why I'm, I'm quick to point out my two-year-old son doing this mathematical thing even though we haven't had mathematical thing, it's, a, it's human nature to uh, abstract. And, and so it, and that's why it kind of irks me a little bit that, you know, when we think about 
when we talk about math education, people talk about things being so abstract as if that's a bad word. I'm like, no, 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 no. Actually, abstraction, when properly understood, is is a great thing. I mean, that's part of what makes us so so um, you, you, uniquely human, right? The ability that human beings have to abstract that no other creatures, uh, at least on this world, are able to do. But that's mathematical. Thank it seems that the list goes on and on in terms of like potential other virtues, right? We could we could spend the entire episode, I think, just going virtue virtue to virtue, right? Um, I guess the thought in my head now, John and I are both traditionally educators and still have a deep love and passion for education, right? When you think about education, let's say at least mostly in the Western world, or we're talking the United States, right? And we think, well, math could be spotlighting this beauty, right? Creating this sort of um, transcendental experience, maybe in certain cases, right? It could be cultivating virtue. My first question is, is it doing those things, <laughs> right? And then my second, my follow-up question is going to be anticipating your answer. If not, why not? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think, um I think there are many teachers who are doing these things in terms of thinking about how to teach mathematics in a way that inspires. Um, I think by and large, it's not happening uh, as much. And, and the reasons, the many re- there are many reasons, the reasons are very complex. Um, I'll just, I'll just point to um, uh, a few. I, I think one is that uh, when you think about about mathematics as virtue versus versus mathematics as just a bunch of skills. You know, when I think of talk about skills, I'm talking about, you know, being able to to factor a quadratic equation or being able to compute the area of a triangle, right? These are these are these are traditionally what people think of as mathematical content, right? Uh, and I'm talking about mathematical practices, but probably even larger than what people think of mathematical practices, because I want to talk about beauty, right? Um, but, you know, mathematical practices are things like being able to reason, being able to uh, look at the structure of a problem, being able to to um, uh, to uh, uh, persist in problem solving, right? These are these are these are practices. Uh, that's what the community calls it. Um, and I'm trying to enlarge that to a bunch of other virtues. These virtues are the things that are going to stay with you the rest of your life, right? Like you're not going to factor a quadratic. Even as a mathematician, I don't factor a quadratic often, right? <laughs> right. But but the things that stick with you are these virtues. And uh, But the problem with often with education is that we're so focused on um, testing uh, that that, you know, if you think about how do you assess skills, that's easy. How do you assess virtues like creativity? That's hard, right? I can give, I can give you 20 different problems about, you know, asking you to compute the area of a triangle, right? And that's often what our, our, our kids are, are subject to, right? It's hard to measure creativity. It's hard to measure persistence and problem solving, or at least somehow uh, people are resistant to it because they they think it feels subjective, right? Uh, and and I would argue actually it's no more subjective than the kind the kinds of qu- choices you make as a teacher to put que- certain questions on the exam. That's also subjective, right? But I, I can tell you there it's pretty easy to d- distinguish between a student who's actually persistent and a student who's not, right? So uh, I'm not. It's not clear to me that that that's any more. A subjective question than than these skills based questions, and so if we're if we're going to change the way math is taught, we actually need to change the way math is assessed, uh, and that's I don't know that's maybe a question for a different podcast or uh, <laughs> that's more aimed at, at, at teachers. But um, but that you know that's that's a that's a problem because people if you have a test if you have some kind of state assessment, then uh, you're going it's it's very natural to want to teach to the test. I'm a teacher and that's how I'm going to get evaluated. 100%, right? Like, and, and we all know how complex this situation is, right? So I don't think anyone's pointing any fingers, but like, can, can we go down the assessment road actually just for a minute? Because yeah. I think, you know, for any listeners, especially with kids, 
it just seems to me how are how is anyone primarily experienced or being exposed to mathematics? It's through what I think for the most part are these sort of traditional school curriculums and different types of pedagogies and all that sort of stuff. But if they're really trying to change their child's relationship to mathematics, they say, hey, this, you know, this Dr. Suga, he makes a lot of sense. I'd love to do this. How might they try to nudge their kids to to think about assessment, right? Or to think about the way that they're growing? Or should they even be thinking about that? Is it that meta, right? Does that question make sense? Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess one way is is to to try to to seek out um, schools or teachers who are who are using more active forms of pedagogy that actually encourage students to think for themselves uh, and to reason and to um, uh, and teachers who are uh, looking out for these many many of these things that people feel are intangible and and actually rewarding those things. Yeah, uh, there are, I mean, uh, there's certainly a number of different kinds of books that I would encourage students, uh, parents or students to, to, to read, um, or, uh, uh, encourage, you know, their kids to, to, to pick up. Uh, but these are all basically things that, that, that look at mathematics as exploration, as inquiry, uh, as, um, um, things that you might actually do with others rather than just solitary endeavors. Like it's playing not, games, it, right? Like playing yeah, games yeah. as a family. Like that's a way, that's a form of strategic thinking. And we need to frame that as mathematics. Yeah, great example. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it all well, sounds very, that's... it all sounds very Montessori, sort of constructivist, right? You know, autonomously yeah. driven, intrinsically right. motivated, curiosity driven. It makes a lot of sense with, I think, a lot of things, you know, that exist in John and I's world. Yeah. And of yeah. course, many, you know, many colleges are moving to, uh, to these modes of instruction as well. And so, um, and well, let's, so, let's try and, yeah, well, let's, let's also try and, if we can, get a, a couple of kind of direct practical strategies that maybe yeah. could be used in, in maths, but also by teachers and other subjects, perhaps too. So there's one section of your book I, I particularly love, which is where you, you write that math can be taught in a way that stifles its beauty. And you connectively discuss a 2018 New York Times op ed entitled Make Your Daughter Practice Math. She'll thank you later. And of that, you write, um, the author never asked the question of how to teach math, so she'll thank you now. Okay, which is a remark I love, right? So it, getting at the idea that people tend to think of maths in terms of its skills for your future yeah. career, yeah. rather than what are you getting from this right now? How much did you enjoy that? How much did you love that? How grateful are you for that experience? So, on? so with, you know, this is, for example, in the context of practicing gratitude within mathematics or um, teaching students how to appreciate the beauty of mathematics and so on. So are there any particular strategies you could recommend for teachers, educators more broadly, for cultivating students, say, appreciation of beauty through mathematics or other subjects or some other virtue that, that mathematics can cultivate? Yeah. Yeah. The first thing I want to say is that, you know, I, I it, 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 as much as I criticize the title of that particular um, uh, the opinion piece, uh, I appreciate what the author was trying to do there, right? I mean, the, she was trying to explain that um, that that uh, uh, mathematics is it was important to you know to learn yeah. and and okay, you know, so I'm not criticizing the the author, and in fact, the 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 usually the the, the titles of the op eds are determined by the um, the newspaper editors and not the the authors themselves. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, of course. But anyways, uh, coming back to it, I guess. Um, in terms of, of seeing beauty, I guess highlighting reasoning and the beauty of reasoning and and how um, how amazing that can be, right? So, I, I mean, an example I like to give is is part, probably my first experience of mathematical beauty was when I was a kid, and um, somebody asked me, "Can you add the numbers from one to 10? And of course, you know, one plus two plus three plus four. Yeah, I don't know. That's not a very interesting problem, right? You know, you get 55, right? Okay, after some effort. Um, but then they said, you know, actually, there's a an, an easier way to do this. If you think about the numbers lined up, one, you know, one, two, three, four, five in a row, right, to up to 10. And you take the, the, the first and the last thing in that list, that's one and 10, they add up to 11. Then hop in one in both ends, two and nine add up to 11. Three and eight add up to 11. 
four and seven add up to 11. And so if you look at that, that's five pairs of things that add up to 11. So five times 11 is 55. And I was like, whoa, actually, that's cool. You know, like there was a quick way of doing that, that, you know, if I had just looked and I had just appreciated the pattern that, that suddenly now it's a simple problem, right? And from there, you could ask the same, you know, similar question. What if I yeah. want to add up the numbers from one to a hundred? Well, that's going to take forever if I do it the long way. But if I see that there's a certain symmetry, one in a hundred, two in 99, three in 98, all these things add up to 101 and there are 50 pairs, mm-hmm. then suddenly 50 times 101 is 5,050. You can do that relatively quickly. That's a, that's sort of an experience of mathematical beauty that, um, you know, as a teacher, one needs to cultivate many such examples uh, yeah. to, to help students see or appreciate or have a glimpse into that kind of, that kind of thing. Mm. Yeah. I like what, um, I like the examples you give from famous pieces of art as well in your book of, for example, Escher paintings, but also when you were speaking that I couldn't help but think of the Vitruvian man by, um, da Vinci, you know, and how that illustrates mathematical beauty and in just this wondrous way, the proportion of parts of the body in relation to mm. mathematical principles as well. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, that's an, another thing that, that, that is, is part of the, I, I think great teaching is being able, you know, yes, you focus on the nitty gritty sometimes and being able to step out and look at the bigger picture, whatever that might be helping people appreciate, you know, art, helping people appreciate how, you know, how it is that, that, you know, our iPhones work with GPS and all that. Like, what does it have to do with the math you're learning? Like being able to contextualize that. Relevance. I think cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it helps people see its, its significance. So, yeah. important. so someone you certainly helped to see the significance of mathematics uh, with, and, you know, connecting this back to your, you know, deeply committed and, deep passion for education and being an excellent pedagogue clearly is this dialogue you have throughout the book. And I presume you continue to have with Christopher Jackson, an inmate serving a 32 year sentence for armed robberies, currently in a high security federal prison who started writing to you seven years into his sentence in 2013 about his passion for maths. And, you know, I love the way that each chapter you include one of your letters with him and and he's kind of really the book orients around this correspondence you have. So please tell us how this correspondence influenced your work on mathematics and flourishing, because it seems to have had a profound effect on you. Yeah, yeah. So in fact, that's that's exactly the way that I, I frame it. It's not really as much a, a story about me helping Chris learn math as much as it's how he how he's helped me see my own discipline in a completely, you know, mm-hmm. a richer and deeper way. And, you know, part of that is just, you know, when I got this letter out of the blue uh, many years ago now, I, from from an incarcerated man serving, you know, a sentence for armed robberies, it, it, it actually, it surprised me, right? Like I was, it, really? Like this, you know, that this man is studying math, right? Like it shouldn't surprise me, but it did surprise me. And I had to ask myself why, right? If I'm deeply committed, uh, and I believe that every uh, every person actually uh, can develop an affection for mathematics. Why did it surprise me so much, right? Um, and so that's that's the question that I opened the book with, uh, is the question of when you think of who does mathematics, would you think of someone like Christopher? And so uh, because of my correspondence with him, you know, I... Uh, it's it's challenged me to sort of wrestle with many of my my deeply um, held beliefs and why I believe them. Um, it's caused me to reflect about on my own experiences where you know certain people uh, didn't didn't have faith in me uh, and why why that was. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's caused me to examine how do I help change the narrative around what mathematics is so that more people can actually benefit from it. And, uh, and so that it can be taught in a way I think that is, is uh, enriching for more people. So how are you changing the narrative? Talk, talk to our audience about some of the things you're involved in and doing and, you know, where you're putting some of your energy and efforts. Yeah. Of course, one way is, is trying to write a book for the public, which, you know, this is, and, 
you know, it's not really, a, that's why I say it's not really a math book as much as it's a book mm-hmm. about what it means to be human. Yeah. Um, part of it is, is thinking about my own instruction, you know, day to day in the classroom, you know, over the last several years now, as I thought about this question about assessment, I've actually changed my assessment practices, right? I actually, on math exams, will ask an essay question that tries to get at, at uncovering a uh, student's appreciation of mathematical beauty mm-hmm. or their their persistence uh, in in problem solving. Uh, and so I'll give an example of a, of a question now okay. that I regularly ask uh, on uh, on a math mathematics exam. I'll, I'll, I'll say, for instance, uh, take an example of a problem that you struggle to solve over the course of this semester uh, and uh, explain to me why the struggle itself was valuable. Uh, whether or not you actually solve the problem, right? Tell me why the struggle itself was valuable. Now, of course, that might come as a surprise to actually get a question like that uh, on an exam, right, at the end of the semester. So, um, and I, I don't recommend doing this unless you spent much of your effort in class talking about what you want students to get out of an experience isn't just the problems themselves, but the virtues like persistence, problem solving, appreciation of beauty, um, creativity, uh, uh, et cetera, right? Uh, and so, you know, one of the things that I, I think is, 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 is great about this is, first of all, I think students are getting the message from me that, that virtues are just as important as skills. Uh, and the second thing, though, is, is the way that's changed my own teaching, because often my students will respond with, with insights that, that 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 have helped me as a teacher, right? Mm-hmm. Like um, uh, students, you know, saying, making certain analogies. Like, okay, here's another question I ask: um, Describe something, uh, one idea that you encountered in this course that you found beautiful, and explain how it is similar to or different than uh, another kind of beauty that human beings encounter. Uh, and so, you know, the kinds of, of examples I, I've gotten there have been ones that actually change the way I teach a subject, right? Because a student will say, this idea was like blankety blank blank, right? That's it, it use an analogy that I would never have thought of. And then it's like, oh, that makes, so I'll give you an example. I, you know, there's this class I teach. It doesn't matter what the topic is, but the, the, the question was to explain to, uh, oh yeah, was this question, what did you find beautiful? And they said this one concept was really beautiful because it it showed me that polynomials have soulmates. <laughs> and I was <laughs> like, what? Yeah, you're right. It actually is true. You know, that because it, it's talked, you know, this concept it relates to polynomials and they travel around together behaving exactly the same way, right? Mm. And this, I said, this is like soulmates. Mm. I've never thought about that before, but you know what? The next time I taught the subject, I talked about how this concept was like Pano was having soulmates. So that's you know that's an example of something that I do now that is because of some of the the the, the reflection, uh, the ways that I've been thinking about how math mm-hmm. has changed. It's changed my own practice as well. Mm-hmm. It seems I've thought this a couple times as we've been going through the conversation that a lot of what we're talking about, whether it's instructionally, right, in terms of a teaching capacity or it's a parent with a kid or, you know, just sort of maybe even changing your own relationship. It's not necessarily about, quote unquote, teaching and learning. There's an element of coaching, right, yes. of asking questions and nudging and guiding, but letting yes. that person explore and arrive, right? Yes, that's right. And and that's that's important because we don't have to be an expert in math to coach our student, our kids well, right? right? If we, if, I think it's much more important to, to help them develop the ability to ask interesting questions. And maybe they're questions we don't know the answer to ourselves. Um, that, you know, that regularly happens in, in a college math course, right? Students will ask me a question. I'll be like, huh, I never thought about that question before. Sure. But well, good on you for figuring, you know, for asking that interesting question because it, it's let's explore it together. You know, that's a that's a posture. I think that whether you're a teacher or, or a parent, it's, it's a valuable, a valuable uh, way to to be. 
Greek. Thank you very 100%, much. 100%, yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Francis, for these practical recommendations. These sound like amazing strategies. And I love that you add this to the end of your, you know, the, the, the exams or the, the tests or assignments that students take. So just to have interest, do you, do you then track that data at all in terms of um, which exercise is most worked to develop um, a, a, a character trait such as resilience, you know, gaining strength through struggle, for example? Are you, are you then developing that as a kind of a character education through mathematics program or, or something like that? Uh, I haven't done anything formally like that. Um, mm. Uh, mainly because I, it, it's not something that I um, uh, that I have expertise in, you know, in, in terms of thinking about how to assess them. But you know, part of what what's happened as I've tried out various kinds of questions is the questions evolve, right? Like maybe the first time I asked the question, it wasn't quite as as um, as uh, focused uh, as it is as it is now, right? Like the beauty part was, what do you find beautiful? You, you, you learn that students will write stuff, but it, it wasn't really what I was getting at, which was explain how it's different to or similar to the kinds of beauty that other, you know, that human beings encounter. Um, or the, or the, 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 uh, the question about taking a problem and explain how the struggle stuff was valuable. Like over time, these questions have kind of evolved. Um, and I mean, in some sense, I look at them as formative assessment, right? I'm not necessarily trying to get at, I mean, I'll, I'll give nearly full credit for any thoughtful answer. I'm more interested in the fact that I'm asking them to do the reflection uh, and I'm trusting that the reflection itself is changing their relationship to the subject. Right, thank you. Before we go to the next question, I just want to add one comment going back to Christopher. Because you you mentioned how his letter can change the way you perceive people that are, that are doing mathematics, and a, a recurrent theme in many of our conversations has been the importance of focusing on individual differences among people yeah. in what it means to flourish. You can have you know an objective theory of what it means to flourish, but then we need to tend to the individual differences among people to to see what each person values, where they place weight on, say a particular domain of well-being such as meaning what they find meaningful in life or which character virtues they really want to develop and so on or what they what really brings them happiness and you have this beautiful quote you write several times in the first chapter every being cries out silently to be read differently yeah i just want to yeah our audience attention to that yeah yeah thank you i i mean that's a that's a quote of simone Weil, and uh i think it captures this yearning that people have to be seen uh, and understood. And, you know, in, in the way we think about mathematics and how we build up our, our kids or our students, if we're teachers uh, into mathematical people, I think we have to um, listen to those yearnings. And we don't do enough of that. Uh, I think uh, we often think of teaching as a one way delivery of information rather than cultivating an active imagination that might look different from student to student. Right, thank you. Right, we have two more questions for you, Francis. The first is about your account of flourishing, because you offer an interesting definition in your book as a wholeness of being and doing, which comprises several areas such as fulfillment of potential, living with honor, dignity, and integrity, and doing good for others. So you've touched upon your definition of flourish. Let's just... Uh, Let's get this explicit and laid out now in the episode. Could you please explain how you define flourishing? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I see flourishing as um, is intimately connected to virtue, uh, and I'm of course not the only one who thinks about it that way. But you know, I, my definition of virtue is excellence of character that leads to excellence of conduct. So there's a being aspect and there's a doing aspect um, to, to virtue, right? So you are um, a persistent, to be a persistent problem solver means that you have a character, you built a character quality that is, that shapes you give the, to, to have a posture of persistence whenever you encounter a difficult problem. So that when you encounter a difficult problem, you act in a persistent way. Uh, and, and I would say that that is intimately tied to what it means to flourish. And so that's why I define flourishing as having a being aspect and a doing aspect. There's a certain wholeness of being and doing. Uh, and 
uh, it enables you to act when the time comes in a way that that is almost second nature. I mean, it's it's very similar to 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 the way we think about moral virtue. Um, you know, if you uh, if you um, have developed a certain moral virtue of selflessness, that means that when the time comes and it's not in your interest to necessarily act, you'll still act because you've developed a selfless posture. Uh, and so, and that's flourishing, right? Like I, I, I want to distinguish between flourishing and happiness, um, mm-hmm. flourishing, um, happiness being sort of a state uh, of mind and flourishing being more of a posture that's going to enable you to act even if you're not happy, right? Like you can still be flourishing even in difficult circumstances. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's, that's why I framed, framed flourishing as a wholeness of being and doing, um, not tied to an emotional state necessarily. Okay. Well, that's a good segue into our final question, which we have creatively titled the flourishing question, but it's basically, it's a how-to question. So when it comes to being and doing, right, and maybe leveraging this synergy you've outlined today between mathematical thinking and flourishing, right, you got to give people one thing to think about or do right? To start to leverage this relationship that, that you write about so beautifully. What's that one thing? With respect to mathematics or just in general? Yeah, mathematics specifically. How might they start to change their relationship with mathematics in a way that would uh, better enable them to flourish? Yeah, I, I guess I, I would uh, encourage people to, to um, uh, appreciate patterns around them and start asking questions like why right like if they see something that's that's beautiful ask them what about what about this structure makes it beautiful if they hear a piece of music that's that's wonderful ask what about the way that the music was created is is uh is um is is wonderful uh if they if they appreciate you know, uh, a, a game, a sports game, uh, a, a certain play that was, that was made during the game, appreciate the kinds of thinking that, that, uh, enabled, uh, that play. Right. So that's, you know, when I think about what, what mathematics is, it, it's often tied to the, the, the beauty of thinking. And so maybe that's, maybe that's one way that people can begin to appreciate it's the, the thank you for that. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that answer. It's perfect. It's it's interesting you brought up the sports piece at the end because just in my head at that very moment, I'm now realizing I've always had um, kind of an affinity for like um, dynasties in sports, right? I actually don't really like the underdog. I want to see kind of the best play the best and then the best win. And And the more you describe it, the more I'm like, oh, I wonder if that's sort of like this mathematical purity where like the biggest, fastest, strongest, most, like it's a source of truth. It's like, oh, it played out the way it was supposed to play out, right? And I haven't really thought about that until today for our conversation. So appreciate the insights and um, the the perspective you bring to this. This has been really, really interesting and a great topic to cover. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for uh, Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's been our pleasure. So uh, why don't you tell people where they can find you, get in touch with you, follow your work, anything like that? Yeah, I, uh, I certainly can find me on uh, on Twitter. Uh, my handle is MathYawp, M-A-T-H-Y-A-W-P. Yawp, like, um, Walt Whitman's The Barbaric Yawp, Math Yawp. Uh, uh-huh. And uh, I think I'm on Instagram, but I don't really trust that much. <laughs> okay. Twitter it is then. Yeah. And how about, you know, your website? Oh, oh website. Yeah. yeah. You can find me at, at um, uh, francissue.com. Uh, and that's spelled like my name. But you can also, if you just Google me, you probably find my, my professional yeah. website yeah. at Harvard. We'll get it in the show notes as well to make it easier. Yeah. Okay. Also. So, yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Francis. Really enjoyed this. Loved your book. And looking forward to learning more about your your future work in this area. Thank you. Huge thanks to all of you for listening to today's show. If you like what you heard, please share it with friends, family, colleagues, and be sure to leave us a five-star review. 
Uh, you can also find us on all social media platforms. Uh, we've got our own YouTube channel and you can check out our website at flourishfmpodcast.com. We'd also love to hear from you. There's a survey in the show notes you can complete where you can complete any suggestions on guests you'd like to hear us interview or particular topics or themes you'd like to hear us talk about. We'd love to hear your feedback on that. So your feedback would be greatly appreciated if you could fill out that form. Until next time, thank you very much for joining us today. And keep putting in the work.